Good day! I would like to talk about one of the most influential books in Philippine history, Diodoro e Agoncillo's The Revolt of the Masses, the story of Bonifacio and the Katipunan. Let the Freedom Ring is the title of the book's part 9. This is to have a sneak peek of what is inside. So the discussion covers about the author, Diodoro Agoncillo, the overview of the book, and its importance in Philippine history. Agoncillo was born last November 9, 1912 in Lemery, Batangas. He graduated in the University of the Philippines in the year 1934 in the course Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy. He wrote The Revolt of the Masses when he was 35 years old. Former President Teostado Macapagal named Agoncillo as a member of the National Historical Institute in 1963. He served in this capacity until his death in 1985. This essayist and poet lived for 72 years. A brief overview of the book, specifically in Part 9, Let Freedom Ring, where two resolutions was made in the Katipunan meeting. First is assassination of Father Mariano Hill, a brutal, cruel, and greedy parish curate. Second is the appointment of Benedicto Nihaga, a lieutenant of carabineers to confer with the millionaire Francisco Rojas. Both its purpose is to force the rich Filipinos to join the Katipunan or just help them financially. The first resolution, which is assassination, still undertaking, when Dr. Valenzuela consulted Nabini for the resolutions. When Spanish authorities discover Father Hill's death, then members of the Katipunan would be obliged to defend themselves, and this would be the real beginning of the revolution, said Mabini. In preparation, Bonifacio secured arms through stealing rifles and revolvers. The Incident Between Two Katipunan Employees of Diario de Manila Agoncillo didn't reveal the reason of the misunderstanding between Apollonio de la Cruz and Teodoro Patino, but it led to a wounded pride of Patino. He told his sister Honoria that the Madre Pontera knew, the reason why Father Hill and Patino talked about it. August 19, 1896, at 6.15 p.m., the Katipunan and its plan was uncovered. Father Hill, Lieutenant Oligario Diaz, and of course, Teodoro Patino became the savior of Spanish territory that time. The lithographic stones used in the printing of the Katipunan receipts was in the printing shop in Diario de Manila and other evidences such as the rules of the Katipunan and documents seen in the locker of Polycarp Utarla, a Katipunan member. Due to this, more than 500 men of Katipunan were convicted. Based on what happened, the 1896 revolution failed. According to Agoncillo, Bonifacio had left behind. There hadn't appeared any biography of him since his death in 1897. But in order to understand Bonifacio, one must understand the Katipunan. However, Bonifacio is a great plebeian, for he came from a poor family and had a little formal education. But this didn't hinder him for being a leader in the Katipunan. Additional facts about the revolt of the masses. It could have been immediately disseminated but its publication had to wait eight years until 1956. And it won first place in a contest, 1947-1948. For the importance of history, one has to know its authenticity and reliability. What makes the happening objective? What could be concluded in history if it is defined? Lastly, the importance of the historical event. In order to answer this, I will base it on Teodoro Agoncillo's perspective. This is from his last interview before his death in 1985. How did history become authentic or genuine? 
To answer this, I will quote Agoncillo's advice for students. The attitude of a student in history should be, do not accept anything until proven otherwise. Doubt everything, including your parentage. Teodoro Agoncillo as a writer revealed this. In the time of writing, you have to forget the present if you can do that. Try to live in the period you are writing. And this makes the history reliable even if the book is a secondary source. Agoncillo compiled the documents, narrated and interpreted it for even he didn't experience or witness the Katipunan, the readers could still feel that they are there using their creative minds. When do we say that the historical happening is objective? For Teodoro Agoncillo, history is never objective. But for me, it becomes objective when we start to doubt, become open-minded, and seek for answers. Because Agoncillo also said that everyone is a historian. Everyone is his own historian. What is the exact meaning of history? History deals with the past, not with the future. We use history to avoid mistakes of the past, not to recreate the very same events you cannot. History can teach us how to deal with today's problem and provide solutions in a better way. History is written by every generation. Every generation writes its own history using the same sources. The interpretations vary according to time. The historical happenings is considered important to correct the wrongdoings that were made and not to commit the same mistakes again. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will tackle the Philippine 1896 Revolution in the eyes of the prestigious historian and writer, Teodoro Agoncillo. We will derive Agoncillo's context on this historical event based on his book, The Revolt of the Masses, the story of Bonifacio and the Katipunan. It is deemed as a classic, secondary source on the history of our father of revolution, Andres Bonifacio, and the revolt led by the organization of his making, the Katipunan. Agoncillo was prompted to write this book due to the events in his time, which was way back in 1940. Japanese colonization, the wars we continued to endure, and eventually our liberation and independence from our colonizers. They somehow mirrored what happened in 1896, and therefore, it was a timely piece. As continuation to Ms. Kalantok's report, we will dwell on part 9, Let Freedom Ring. It ended last time with the confirmation of the presence and intelligence on the inner workings of the Katipunan already being leaked. The truth on the rumors of a group clamoring for a revolution was quickly spreading. This was why Bonifacio, Emilio Asinto, and Dr. Pio Valenzuela got together and decided to go through with the plan on associating the wealthy but indifferent or hostile Filipinos to the Katipunan. They did this by creating and spreading letters that indicated a list of wealthy Filipinos who they set up as major financiers of the group, and that they share in their fight and would support them no less. The signatures were forged, learned and practiced by men in the group. They had to do this because they could not think of any other way to reach out to these rich Filipinos who choose to turn a blind eye to the atrocities of the Spaniards and how they would have been a huge help in fighting for the freedom of the country. With what they have done, each of the wealthy Filipinos they have implicated would be arrested. And it is in that moment that they hope they would despise the Spaniards enough for them to finally join the collective cause. As the three were planning for a final Katipunan General Assembly, it was also decided that they will send a rescue party for Jose Rizal and stage a kidnapping for him to be able to join in the rise of the revolution. He was bound to Cuba to be a military surgeon. The launch Caridad will transfer him to the cruiser Castilla, where he would stay and wait for the steamer that would take him to Cuba. Caridad was piloted by a Catipunero, thus Jacinto was able to be aboard. 
Disguised as a mariner, he told Rizal that they could help free him, but he declined. The idea of an armed revolution was against the principles of Rizal. He valued education more as the stepping stone for independence. The rescue team went back to Bonifacio with only Rizal's refusal. With the discovery of the KKK, their safety and secrets remain at large, which is why Bonifacio instructed his messengers to inform the leaders of the Katipunan from various places that the General Assembly for their plan of action will take place on the 24th of August in Balintawak. As the message was relayed, the different members of the group carefully headed towards the location. On the 21st of August, Bonifacio and Jacinto agreed to change the society's code from alphabets into numbers to safeguard their secrets. On the 23rd of August, more than a thousand members of the Katipunan were gathered in the yard of Juan Ramos in Pugatlawi. He was the son of Melchora Aquino, also known as Tandang Sora or the mother of Katipuneros. It was here that they decided to launch the revolt against the Spanish government on the 29th of August, and as a symbol of their commitment to the cause and to the nation, they ripped their settlers apart and cried glory for the Philippines. The civil guards were able to catch up on their trail on the 24th and attack them, but they managed to escape. With this news, the Spanish commanded to deliver more men in Pasong Tamo to finish the rebels still remaining there. Yet, the place was already deserted. No one in sight until two farmhands were seen in the area. They were just heading their way home, but the Spaniards shot them anyway, just to have something to report back to their superiors. They reported it as a bloody battle and that they drove the rebels far back to the hinterlands, which was why the story of the cry in Pugatlawin happening in the 26th was circulated. And not long after, the day had come. It was on the 29th of August, 1896, that the Filipinos finally rose up and fought for their land. Persuasion and dialogue with the Spanish has long proved to be ineffective. Everything had to be taken at arms. And these are the motives that drove the Filipinos to aggressively take back their liberty. The Spanish friars continued to raise prices on rent even with the economic and agricultural crisis people felt. Tenants who plant trees on their leased lands were also being charged tax with unknown reasons. Tax could be paid in kind or through non-monetary terms, such as sacks of rice. And instead of using the legal measure in receiving tax in kind, they create their own ways to be able to earn from it. They also arbitrarily fix prices and products. They force evict tenants from the land they have toiled and labored for years, or include these lands in their map to confiscate them from Filipinos who have supposedly inherited it from their forefathers. Number six is persecution. They deported families who resort to legal means. And they refuse to do basic services that are free, such as burying the poor, and charge excessive rates for their services like religious rights and even intimidate the poor to give what little left they have for the parish. They meddle with family affairs for their own benefit, since they use it to wreak problems towards who opposed them. They oppress the native clergy by sending them to prison or by randomly reassigning them somewhere else. They also control the assignment of native priests to their parishes, which results to parishes being led by not the most deserving clergy. The friars were also very scandalous, since they completely disregard the laws and decrees of the government and the church. They oppress and persecute Filipinos and those who could not fluently speak in Spanish. They were the embodiment of scandal instead of models of Christian conduct due to their vices and incompetence. And finally, they opposed the overall progress of the country. These, among many more others, are what pushed our forefathers to finally end the tyranny of the Spanish regime. Overall, this was just a snippet 
of a Gonsilius narration of the 1896 revolution. This is just a piece of our past, our history as Filipinos. And history is said to be the study and inquiry of life in the past, based on evidence in relation to present context and future developments. This definition already gives us a glimpse on why there is a great importance in studying our history. It helps us understand and know more the world that we live in. It connects us to our society and to people and provides us the knowledge or data to create laws and or theories that will help in comprehending more how we as people work together. It also gives us our identity. Imagine not being able to know about your past, of looking back and finding nothing. That leaves a huge gap in our growth as humans. It also relates to our present contexts. What happens in our generation is said to be mirrored from the past. The conflicts we experience can be traced back and understood more by similar events in the past. Just like COVID-19, a pandemic and numerous plagues also occurred before. Lastly, history shows us time, how fast it changes, and how much we have evolved. These are what make history a vital part of our being and our studies because it ultimately builds our future. I will end my presentation by a Gonsilius answer on an interview and a line from his essay, History as Humanities. What history is not biased? History is never objective because it is a recreation of the past as seen by historians. It is this subjectivity that characterizes great historians. Thank you and a pleasant afternoon to all. Good afternoon, ACA2. Good afternoon, sir. In this topic, we will discuss the seeds of discontent from Tidoro Agoncillos, the revolt of the masses, the story of Bonifacio and the Katipunan. There was a time in the revolution against Spain where a split was developed in the society. The Katipunan of Cavite divided into two factions, the Magdiwang and the Magdalo. Each faction exercised sovereign power over a number of towns, including those in Batangas bordering Cavite. As independent entities, the leaders of the two provincial councils never got together to elect one supreme council that would hold sway over the entire province, the Magdiwang proceeding with its election independently of the Magdalo. Magdalo was led by Baldomero Aguinaldo and it was based in Cavite, while Magdiwang was led by Mariano Alvarez and it was based in Noveleta, Cavite. When Cavite led by its rival factions, the leaders fell into disputes arising from the desire of one group to lord it over the other. Neither of the two factions would bow to the other or allow itself to be placed under its rival's command. There was no serious open breach, but the silent conflict that threatened to wreck the unity. Magdiwang men invited Andres Bonifacio to visit Cavite and see for himself all that had been accomplished by the revolutionists in the area and to intervene in the conflict. But Bonifacio, informed of the situation, refused to heed the request of the Magdiwang leaders. Bonifacio informed them that to succeed in the revolution against Spain, the leaders must not be concentrated in a single place. And on the third invitation, written by Artemio Ricarte upon the instruction of Mariano Alvarez, Bonifacio acceded to the request. With his wife and two brothers, Siriaco and Procopio, Bonifacio left for Cavite about the middle of December 1896. It was at this preliminary meeting that a misunderstanding arose between the Magdalo leaders and Bonifacio. Aguinaldo was irritated with Bonifacio because he acted as if he were a king and through Bonifacio's gestures and behavior. The Supremo upon seeing Fernandez ordered his arrest. Remembering that Fernandez was the one who promised to attack the Spaniards in Laguna and Morong, but the promise was never carried out. Bonifacio blamed him for the defeat in San Juan and was determined that he should not go unpunished. 
as supreme head of the Katipunan, Bonifacio had realized that he had very little influence in the Magdalo area because the Magdalo chieftains, to whom Fernandez had run for shelter, refused to arrest him. The misunderstanding that existed between the followers of the Magdiwang and the Magdalo deepened into mutual suspicion and jealousies that resulted in military reverses in several sectors. For this purpose, the leaders of the Magdiwang and the Magdalo decided to call a convention or assembly at Imus. In the assembly hall, Bonifacio entered, proceeded to the head of the table, and unceremoniously occupied the chair. He beckoned to the Magdiwang ministers to sit at his right side. And Baldomero Aguinaldo, the president of the Magdalo, sat to the left of Bonifacio. General Emilio Aguinaldo was contended to be a mere observer since it was the intention of his faction to propose the establishment of a revolutionary government. The proposal was evident that the two factions would never come to an understanding. The Magdalo people further contended that the Cavite must not be divided between the two factions. On the other hand, the Magdiwang followers argued that the Katipunan already had a constitution and bylaws duly approved and enforced. Magdiwang Minister of War Ariston Villanueva said that if a new government was to be established, Andres Bonifacio has the right to occupy the presidency without any election. But the Magdalo group strenuously objected and insisted on an election. The assembly was adjourned and each faction left without any tangible result and understanding. The town fiesta of San Francisco de Malabon was held in January 1897, were disturbed by a series of rifle shots. They later found out that the rifle shots came from the men of Captain Mariano San Gabriel. Alvarez, the president of Magdiwang, was furious and demanded that San Gabriel disarm his men, but the latter refused and left for Noveleta. The situation had not eased up a bit when the leaders of the Magdiwang planned to hold another convention in the estate house of the Heros, a Magdiwang territory. The government under the Magdalo was at the time seriously threatened by the Spanish army which occupied the estate house of Salitran. General Emilio Aguinaldo leading the Magdalo soldiers faced the Spaniards in Salitran. It was March 22, 1897, Aguinaldo's birthday, when simultaneously the battle raged and the assembly convened at Tejeros. Kidora Goncilius, The Revolt of the Masas, The Story of Bonifacio and Katipunan is one of the most influential books in Philippine history. For a secondary source, a Goncilius account was first written in 1947. The publication of this was in 1956 by the College of Liberal Arts of the University of the Philippines. A Goncilius seed of discontent mentioned about the events that happened before the Tejeros Convention. It indicates the details such as dates, places, and important events about the misunderstanding between the two factions that led to the assembly in Tejeros. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Althea K. T. Hiramis, and I am from Group 5. I am here to report to you the continuation of the seed of this content from Teodoro Agoncillo's book, The Revolt of the Masses. So the Tejeros Convention was a meeting between the Magdiwang and Magdala factions of Katipunan, held at the Estate House of the Tejeros in San Francisco, Malabon, on March 22, 1897. These are the first presidential and vice-presidential election in the Philippine history, although only the Katipuneros were able to take part and not the general population. The main purpose of the convention was called to discuss the defense of Cavite against the Spaniards during the Philippine Revolution, but instead, the convention became an election to decide the leaders of the revolutionary movement by passing the Supreme Council. The shown image in the slide is a perspective view of the Estate House of the Tejeros. It was the place that witnessed the very first election under the guidance of the Katipunan government. Invitations were distributed by the Magdiwang chieftains to the Magdalo followers. However, 
not all Magdalo followers were able to attend because of the battles storming around their locality. It was past two in the afternoon when Jacinto Lombreras, acting president of the Magdiwang, formally opened the convention. Severino de las Alas immediately stood up and said that they should agree on what kind of government that should be administered to the whole country before they discuss means of defending a small part of Cavite to the Spaniards, and that the K in Katipunan did not identify what kind of government they had. But Tumdaras disagreed since the government was already established upon the founding of the Katipunan, and that they should focus more on the main purpose of the meeting, which is to discuss defensive measures. Bonifacio supported the thought of Lombreras. Bonifacio defended that it should be maintained as republic. According to him, all of its members of any given rank shall serve under the principle of liberty, equality, and fraternity, upon which republicanism was founded. Antonio Montenegro, a Magdalo man, stood up and shared his thoughts in agreeing with De Las Alas, and if they do not do what De Las Alas suggested, they were to be most likely known as animals without reason. His thoughts touched the hearts of the Magdiwang listeners. Santiago Alvarez was very irritated on what Montenegro said, because he believed that the Magdiwang faction recognized the government organized by the Association of the Sons of the People, and that they do not need the advice or opinion of Montenegro. Lumbreras was very disappointed in the current situation. As he felt useless, he stepped down from his position in presiding the assembly. Bonifacio, as the president of the Supreme Council of the Katipunan, immediately took the place of Lumbreras and recognized the petition of a new norm of government with the condition that they will agree upon the decision of the majority. The Republic of the Philippines was then and there proclaimed amidst enthusiastic hurrahs. With a new form of government, the election of officers was then prepared. Nine officers were to be elected, namely the President, Vice President, Captain General, Director of War, Director of Interior, Director of State, Director of Finance, Director of Pamento, and Director of Justice. Bonifacio was then aware of his limitation and proposed that whoever would be elected should be recognized and respected, regardless of his social condition or education. For the presidency, Aguinaldo won over Bonifacio and Mariano Trias. For the vice presidency, Trias won over Bonifacio, De Las Alas, and Alvarez. The election of Captain General came next, and Ricarte won over Alvarez. The elected officers for the Director of War and Director of Interior was Emiliano Riego de Dios and Andres Bonifacio, respectively. The election went smooth, not until the election of Bonifacio, which almost turned into a bloody affair. Daniel Terona spoke up and said that the Director of Interior should be someone who holds a lawyer's diploma. He suggested to replace Bonifacio and choose Jose de Losario, a lawyer from his province, instead. Bonifacio was deeply hurt and insulted because they already agreed to respect someone who is elected despite his social condition and education, but Terona did not listen. Bonifacio was triggered and whipped out his pistol. Fortunately, Ricarte prevented Bonifacio from shooting. The people who attended the meeting was very disappointed and started to walk away. Bonifacio was deeply hurt, dissolved the meeting, and annulled all that was approved and resolved. And there, the seed of discontent resulting from the failure of Bonifacio to get the presidency, and which was watered by a series of unfortunate events, ended. And with this... Group 5's discussion on Teodoro Agoncillo's book, The Revolt of the Masses, has ended. Thank you and God bless.